um yes uh if you don't want your video you can meet on of your cameras if you want and this call it's going to be recorded as i have just started and i will want to start with the code of conduct and community participation guidelines for open life science if you experience any unacceptable behavior you can um, send in a message to the team or you can report individually to Malvika, Berenice, Yo, Paz, or Amy. And we have transcript for this session. If you want to follow that, uh, please take a moment to um, reflect whether you want to be in a breakout room for writing or you want to break, uh, be in a breakout room for speaking by adding an S for a W to your names. And that will help us in the breakout rooms later in the call. Today, we are going to have a presentation on open garden. And I would want you to please sign in your name. And then we have an icebreaker question there. Uh, what is your recent favorite tool or app or software? I will be really interested to hear people's favorite softwares. Um, thank you, Leo. So please do add that to your to the ice uh, the icebreaker equation in the etherpad. You may also want to do that in the chat if you prefer that. Both options are open. So we're going to have three presentations today. Um, for actually, there will be an introduction to open science by Yo. We are going to have another presentation on open data by Sarah. We have another presentation on openness to diversity of knowledge by Miguel. And the other presentation we're going to have is open evaluation. All these presentations will be roughly 10 minutes. And then we have um, opportunity for questions and comment after each session. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. I think I would like to start the first general introduction to the session. Okay, I will be sharing my screen in a moment, please. Um, can you see my screen? It's supposed to say Open Science Garden. Um, yes. We've got a lot of tabs, man. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so um, today we are going to have a presentation at Open Science Garden, and this is the sixth week of um, the OLS program, Open Seed. And today we are going to have the first Open Science Garden. We have a few other Open Science Gardens in week 10 and week 12 coming up. So this is the first of the three that you are going to have. I think this is really an important um, topic in the mentorship program because it's repeating itself three times. So I think there is a lot of value in openness to the community. So what are we learning today? So the learning objectives for this session are three. Uh, define open science as responsible research, list the different principles of open science, and give examples of use cases of different open science principles. Uh, we are going to have a sponsor call, and this is coming from Lena. Thank you so much. Uh, I, so uh, this call is uh, sponsored by Freie Universiteit Amsterdam, uh, VU Amsterdam. And um, the reason for that is that we have a partnership with OLS uh, at the Freie Universiteit, <laughs> Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. We uh, announced a uh, 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 open science and open science challenge award for courageous people who would like to make their research more open even more open uh, and uh, participate in OLS 8 and uh, there is something magic about number 8 we have eight projects <laughs> that participate uh, at um, OLS 8 from view Amsterdam 
and the money comes from the open science program. That's why I put the screenshot of our open science page on this uh, slide. Um, yeah, so like the, the, this is a, this, a, this is a wonderful collaboration. I'm so happy that we can uh, give a uh, few researchers an opportunity to learn about open science in this uh, wonderful international cohort. And I'm very grateful for like everyone who yeah, helps us uh, and uh, for the ma magical infrastructure we can use. And of course, it's nice that we can also can support OLS a little bit by uh, covering the costs for some of the calls and uh, for the mentors. Um, thank you very much, Lena. And it's really a wonderful collaboration with uh, VU Amsterdam. I will stop sharing my screen and I will call on you for the first presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Taj. Um, and as someone um, who's perhaps been around in OLS a tiny bit longer, I just want to say, Lena, seeing our graduates from the earlier programs come back and offer partnerships like this um, and the ability to support and spread this further makes such a difference. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being able to do this. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I could be prouder if I could go back and tell Yo of four years ago that our graduates were coming and helping us spread it further. So anyway. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Okay, folks, I'm going to do the screen share. Um, Right. Are you seeing what I hope you're seeing? All right, I see nods, beautiful. So I was reviewing my slide deck just before um, before while well, uh, Taj and Lena were preparing and I looked and I spotted a mistake that I remember presenting last time. I'm like, oh God, I should have corrected that by now because that was the previous cohort, but I haven't. <laughs> so I'll point it out, just feel, feel free to laugh at me. Anyway, we say open science garden, but Honestly, if uh, if you don't consider your work science, that doesn't mean this isn't for you. Open science as a phrase has gained a whole lot of traction, especially in the last year or so when NASA and the White House have announced the year of open science is 2023. But you research scholarship, maybe you're not an academic. This is still stuff that's designed to be useful and interesting for you, no matter your domain. The main thing is that you want to share and broaden the um, broaden human knowledge. And one day I'm going to go back and say, gosh, you are being so exclusionary there. You're only talking about humans, yo. But I'm guessing that'll be in a few years. <laughs> um, so what we care very much about, um, and I will say this over and over, is we care about sharing responsibly. And that does not mean radical openness and openness for everything. For example, um, places that I might not want to be open, there are many, many, but one might be, let's say, the microgrants program that we have. Someone might not wish to share that they couldn't afford to buy their own headset because uh, in some scenarios they feel uncomfortable admit about admitting that. So I won't. I, I would never advocate that we should be open about everything. There's all sorts of stuff in my life that doesn't need to be open. So as responsible researchers, um, we we need to think about making sure that we're that we're sharing things appropriately um, and share if we can. Uh, but don't share if we shouldn't as well. So thinking about responsible research and the impacts of what we do when we share the work that we have. Um. And so I've got some nice lists here. I do like them. Uh, be responsible. This this bullet point says respect the law. There are times when I definitely don't agree with that. That's a general rule if you can respect the law. But the law is not always just. So I, I won't always say that we should respect the law if the law itself isn't right. Um, supporting transparency, openness and honesty towards each other and not only to each other, but to the public. If you don't, if you are a researcher, try not to just be in the ivory tower, but relate also with people who are perhaps outside of that tower, um, because we're trying to maximize pu public benefit. That's the large reason probably why we've decided that we want to share what we're doing um, and unintentionally, but this threads on nicely from just before where Lena was saying that Cho University is helping to sponsor this call and some and uh, some other participants. Continue to learn and mentor others when you have those skills. Uh, pass them on. The whole teacher mentor fish thing, or maybe this is like uh, creating a school for fishing. <laughs> um, 
so open science will argue um, or open research or scholarship is specifically supporting uh, transparency and maximizing that public benefit um, and like I've sort of already been emphasizing responsible research does not mean everything open and there are places where stuff shouldn't be open uh, for example conservation data so right near my house Oh God, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I okay, let me let me rephrase. So I'm not doing exactly what I said not to do. There are places where, for example, a um a bird or an animal may breed that um because they're very, very rare, you don't want to share that because you don't want people to to poach them or to to cause problems in their breeding area or things like that. Um, so there's times to be cautious around conservation data. Medical records is one that's well known. It's an easy example. But another example of scenarios where maybe you don't want to share, and I'm not, I won't say never share, but be cautious, is uh, things like indigenous data because of a history of exploitation in the past. Um, and this was a quote that I think Malvika threw out uh, just very quickly, but I liked it so much that I, I threw it in here just 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 to mess with her as a good friend um, and one of the OLS directors. But openness is holding the responsibility to be transparent about the decisions we make and protecting information as needed. Um, <clears throat> so you may have someone say how do I choose which definition of open science to use because if you look out there there are too many to count it's really popular and that's great that's great but it does mean you don't know which to use um I I would say figure out which ones work for you use them all or maybe just say there are many here are some I like these ones because so a couple that we've highlighted here uh the movement to make things accessible to all levels of society and that's from Foster. And another one might be unhindered access. Um, and this talks about scientific articles, data and collaborative research. Um, that still sounds very top down. Um, and I, I like invo involving people as much as possible rather than making it top down. Uh, so that's why I'm saying take all of the pieces from different definitions that are meaningful to you. Um, Another one from UNESCO is a set of principles to make scientific research accessible to everyone, uh, not only scientists, but society as well. Um, are those both UNESCO or is one lacking a quote? I know, I need to go and figure that out, what's going on with this slide, because otherwise it almost feels like that second bit's repeating. Maybe it's not. Anyway, okay, I'll move on. Panic. Yeah, so I sort of, I, I think that I'm forgetting what I've had in the slides and I'm often saying what's on a slide before the slide comes up, which is very typical me. Um, so very often science and research is viewed as top down and here's what I've done, come and enjoy uh, from the bottom of my tower or my mountain as this one is portrayed. Um, but I'll argue that really this should be much flatter and that we should be collaborating because populations that are involved in research and affected by research should also be calling shots, even if they don't always have the same training in research methods that a um, trained researcher may do. And remember I told you that I'd spotted a mistake I hadn't corrected. Tell me which pillar is on here twice. <laughs> I don't know what one I'm missing and I will try and figure this out before the next time I do this presentation. Um, but there are various different pillars out and around here. Um, and we've tried to represent them and accidentally made a sort of quite nice menorah here. Um, so I have open data, open source methods, how you do what you're doing. Uh, open source refers to the code, by the way, if, if you use code, not everyone does. I've got open data again, oops. Uh, then we've got open peer review, so sharing um, what we're doing and open access is the access to articles and re resources, educational resources. And I really want to figure out what the missing pillar I have that I've put twice is, but right now I cannot tell you, apologies. Um, we, so a lot of the calls in the open science garden are referencing either these pillars or um, in, in some cases, I think it's the UNESCO definition. So we've talked about openness to diversity of knowledge, social actors, open data, um, and those are spread out amongst the different open science garden calls that we have. Um, so as I mentioned, three talks uh, per call, or rather Taj mentioned, three talks per call covering um, a different element um, of open science. And we try and do discussions and reflections as well, because well, it's one thing to hear someone talking a lot and it's another thing to actually apply it yourself and then 
and you realize that it's a lot more nuanced than you may have thought at first blush and maybe you can't do this and maybe you can't do that i've seen it described as a buffet in many cases take what makes sense don't take the bits that don't work for you um that's me i'm going to stop doing the talking and taj hand it back over to you um thank you very much yo uh so i'm not sure if we have any questions or comments i'm from that, anybody wants to say something or add or a reflection? Anything that comes to your mind? No? Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. So I uh, will call on the first presenter, um, Sarah, with open data. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. I've just put my slides in the the chat or in the uh, in the notes document, so you can follow along there as well. If you prefer. So thanks so much for having me today. Um, I am going to talk about preparing, curating, and connecting. Um, and I, going off the open science pillars theme, I think of these as the open, the, the kind of pillars of, of open data reuse. Um, so these are our steps to amplify the impact of open data by making it ready for reuse. So that's going to be kind of the focus of, of my talk today. I'm Sarah Lippincott. I'm the head of community engagement at Dryad. I'm a librarian by background, and I'm enthusiastic about making data open and reusable. And I'm also here to help. If you have any questions about Dryad or my presentation, you can feel free to get in touch with me at sarah at datadryad.org um, or get in touch directly with our help desk if you have uh, specific technical questions about Dryad. Um, and that's at help at datadryad.org. Dryad is an open data publishing platform and community committed to the open availability and routine reuse of all research data. We serve all research domains, um, so we, we publish data in every discipline and, and any format, um, and we're a leader in, in research data. We've been publishing data since 2008 and uh, now have over 50,000 data publications representing the work of over 200,000 researchers at over 70,000 institutions worldwide. And our data sets are connected to articles in over 1,200 different academic journals. And we also publish data independent of, of an article publication. So we publish null results or, or other data sets that might not be associated with a specific um, research article. Everything in Dryad is fully curated. That means that our team of curators looks at every data set before we publish it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that step uh, in, in detail. We also permanently archive everything that we publish. We publish it under a Creative Commons public domain CC0 uh, license waiver or public domain dedication. Um, you, uh, this is, uh, you can read a little bit more about why exactly we choose CC0 for data on our, on our blog, um, but this is to remove as many restrictions as possible on data reuse for, for other researchers. So that's one of, the, one of the ways in which we optimize data for reuse specifically at Dryad. And finally, everything that we publish is accessible at datadryad.org uh, for, for humans, as well as through our open API for machine access. At Dryad, we believe that science is a social process. This is a quote from a recent editorial in, uh, science, uh, science, in the journal Science. Um, Discoveries do not become knowledge until the findings are shared with the scientific community to be vetted, challenged, and expanded upon. So at Dryad, we really think about moving beyond just access to data and findability of data, the F and the A in FAIR data. And we want to be moving more toward, we want to be moving towards reuse. What makes data actually reusable? What puts it in conversation with the scientific community um, and, and can spark that social process of discovery? Too often we see that um, data are, are uploaded piecemeal uh, uh, as this editorial in, in ecology, the journal um, 
uh, ecology and evolution says with without accompanying metadata, without the context that are needed for reuse or reproducibility, um, and uh, meaning that the potential for reuse is limited in uh, in many repositories or when when researchers share just a data availability statement, the potential for other researchers to actually come in and build upon that work is really limited. They may not understand how the data was collected, uh, what what uh, steps were used to to process or analyze it. Uh, they may not know if they can reuse it if it doesn't have an explicit license saying saying what uh, what the terms are for reuse. Um, so that data kind of goes and and uh, is it, it might be accessible, it might be findable um, uh, in in the best case, but it might not, but is it actually reusable or is it does it just sit there um, and uh, and that's kind of the end of its life. So when uh, so Dryad really encourages everyone who deposits with us to think about what makes data reusable and to think really broadly about data reuse and what that might look like. Reuse might be reproducing or replicating results of and to you know to uh, help to validate research to increase uh, integrity scientific integrity. It might be repurposing data for an entirely new experiment or, or purpose. It might be using it as benchmarking data or as a, as a, a reference data set. Um, it might be used in a meta-analysis, aggregating data from a number of different studies to produce, uh, to produce a broader set of results. It might be used to seed machine learning algorithms. Increasingly, we're, we're seeing machine access uh, to, to data sets um, and the use of data to, um, to help uh, to, you know, for, for artificial intelligence and machine learning. It might be used in teaching and learning. Um, we see a lot of use of Dryad data in data science uh, courses uh, where, where uh, or in um, statistical analysis courses, or in life sciences courses, where researcher, where uh, professors want their students to use real-world data to perform some analyses or draw their own conclusions. Um, so reuse can take a lot of different forms. It can look really different, um, and it may not be it may not be researchers even from within the same field who might end up uh, coming across data and and uh, thinking about ways to make it reusable. So the first pillar of, of data, uh, making data reusable um, from the Dryad perspective, my slide will, will advance, Let's see, here we go, is preparation. So it starts with you. It starts with the researcher, the data creator, um, and how you, uh, how you prepare the data for sharing. We encourage you to think about all the data that might be needed to reanalyze the results or to think about a subset of data. If, as, uh, um, as Yo mentioned, if you have data, we get a lot of conservation data at Dryad. Um, and, and so we, we don't share, you know, we don't want geolocation coordinates for sensitive endangered populations. Um, but is there a subset of data or a set of data that's been anonymized that you can share publicly that might still be of use to others in the community? So think about all of the data that might be needed to replicate or reanalyze your results. Uh, think about what can be shared publicly versus what is sensitive and might need to be be withheld. Choose open file formats. Um, that's a this is one that's important for both human and machine reuse. Open file formats um, like choosing um, a CSV rather than than uh, Microsoft Excel, and certainly choosing CSV or Microsoft Excel over a PDF. Uh, with a table embedded in it, for example, is really key to both human and machine reuse of data. It's also key for um, long-term data access. Open file formats are much easier to preserve over time. So if you are the data reuser, in many cases, you, you might be the reuser of your own data later uh, for, you know, for additional um, analysis or, or new studies, your data is going to be more reusable for you and for others when it's in an open format. Same thing for organizing your files logically. Um, it's easier for both you and other future reusers if things are organized into, into directories that, that make logical sense, if they're named in ways that make it easy to tell what's inside a file. And finally, preparing and describing your data 
in a detailed readme file that talks about how data was collected, prepared and analyzed, that defines all of your variables, um, defines any abbreviations you use, units of measurement, et cetera. We have a lot more information on this uh, at the link here um, on our, uh, in our best practices documentation. So you've done your part. That's where Dryad comes in next with our curation step. We have a team of curators on site that actually goes back after, after you and checks on a lot of these factors. We look and make sure that there's no sensitive information that's been accidentally included in, uh, in a data file. We verify that we can actually open all of the files and that other researchers could reasonably interpret what's inside. And we support you um, in uh, uh, media, uh, remedying anything that we find that would make data difficult uh, to reuse in the future. And finally, we help you build connections between your data and its creators, uh, the uh, associated research outputs, all of these other things that kind of bring the data set to life. <clears throat> so what this looks like in practice on Dryad is using a lot of persistent identifiers. Um, so ORCID IDs to identify authors, uh, research organization registry IDs to identify institutions related, uh, including DOIs for related works. And all of this helps to make your data more um, kind of to make authoritative connections between your data and all of the all of the associated entities that helped to create it, fund it, um, or that came out of it. It also means that if re if someone does reuse your data, ideally we'll be able to to find that reuse um, and show it in our data citations here. So you'll be able to see if someone has, has cited your data using the DOI of your data set, we'll be able to pull that information back into Dryad and continue building out this kind of web of, of uh, networked information. These are just some of the some of the persistent identifiers we use and kind of what they refer to um, around the data set. So I'll uh, be happy to take any questions you have about Dryad, about uh, about and about uh, increasing data reusability. Um, thank you, sir. I'm checking the chat if we have questions. Um, we have a few questions there. Uh, so the first one I see is concerned to see that Dryad is still using Twitter. What plans do you have to move away from this platform? That's, That's a great a question. question. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, so we are um, exploring other other platforms for social media. We have I've recently launched our Mastodon account and Blue Sky accounts. Um, we're a small organization, so I am the the kind of uh, community engagement and outreach and communications and marketing team. So um, I'm working on seeing kind of where we can get the most traction so that I can focus my effort on on other platforms uh, uh, outside of outside of Twitter. I would like to very briefly um, also just address this one from the OLS side, folks, because uh, I'm going to suggest I'm going to open up a thread to talk about this a bit more in Slack so that we don't derail the whole conversation today. <laughs> um, but I do want to point out that I have uh, plenty of community members who are um, from lower middle income or marginalized areas who say, if I leave Twitter, I will no longer have reached to a lot of my previous previous people who I've been communicating with. And it's super important to us that we don't end up accidentally only having an audience from rich uh, European and North American countries. Um, and it's important to us to meet people where they are. So I think it, it's, it, it try and recognize that whilst Elon, I think we can all happily say, is making that place a heck of a lot worse. There are there are other sides and reasons to remain. Um, but thank you for your great response, Sarah. And sorry for busting in Tash. <laughs> um sure. Thank you. Um you thank you, Sarah. Um that was really um a great presentation. Uh anyone wants to add a comment or maybe a question that we hasn't been written 
or someone wants to speak it out or write it down. Okay, I guess it's a no. I, again, I would really love to have a few questions, but we move on. Um, the second presentation is going to be by Miguel. Please um, go ahead. Great. All right. Um, let me just pull up my presenter view. Please tell me you don't see my presenter notes. You only see um, uh, the logo. Oh, I'm sorry, Mix. We see exactly what you don't want us to see. Yeah, right. <laughs> let, me just, let me just do very quickly the thing where I just show a portion of my screen. There you go. That should work, no? Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, <laughs> This is always why I have this emergency screen um, up front. Always fails, always fails when it's important. All right. Uh, it's great to be in this room of passionate people. Thank you so much, Yo and Pat, for the invitation. So just in the way of introduction, I'm Migs. I'm the co-founder and chief behavioral strategist at the ANSI Behavioral Science Lab. We provide research and training and consultancy on multi-country work, especially with vulnerable populations particularly on human flourishing through state-of-the-art behavioral science methodology. I'm also an associate director of the Psychological Science Accelerator, a global network of more than 2,000 researchers across 80 countries. And these days, I'm also part of the Scientific Steering Committee for the Global Initiative for Loneliness and Social Connection. And with Templeton World Charity Foundation, I'm reviewing and potentially establishing collaborative research hubs in Southeast Asia and the Arab region. In other words, much of my life today is about big team science and global collaborative research networks. When Paz first invited me for the talk, she invited me to talk about openness to diversity of knowledge. Um, and when I was thinking, what can I talk about in terms of diversity of knowledge? Well, I was thinking even in this cohort, there's so much knowledge and so much expertise both in this cohort and in the spaces and organi organizations that we orbit in. So I decided to tackle a seemingly simple question, even deceptively simple question. How do we learn or how can we learn from each other in global large scale collaborative research networks? So as a quick introduction as well of one of the organizations that I'm involved in, the Psychological Science Accelerator or the PSA, we're a distributed network of researchers across the globe that aim to accelerate accumulation of psychological knowledge that is reliable and generalizable to a broader spectrum of humanity and to really make science less weird. So we do multi-country work across the globe with thousands of participants on a variety of research lines on uh, multiple world regions. Um, uh, and it's not, for example, uncommon to have authors of more than 200 or 400 researchers working on one project, for example. We can talk about big team science the whole day, um, but before I answer the title of my talk, I do want to quickly uh, talk about some benefits of big team science. As, with, uh, as everyone knows, with big team science, people can just collaborate and share resources, leading to so much capacity for data collection. And more than that, people can specialize in their roles. Some people can focus on data management and computational reproducibility. Some people can focus on project management, some on ethics, on translation, and so on. You don't need to be a one-man scientist in a big team science game. Importantly as well, of course, you have so much knowledge and so much expertise at your disposal. But as you can imagine, Knowledge sharing isn't necessarily very straightforward, especially if there's hundreds and thousands of people involved, and especially if the knowledge comes from people across cultures, across geographies, across languages, across career levels and disciplines. So how can we learn from each other? One of the things that I want to start with is really the simple launching point of where do we want heterogeneity in our networks and where is it important to be not so homogenous, uh, heterogeneous? In other words, where should we be diverse? On one hand, of course, it's important to have different perspectives across disciplinary backgrounds, across expertise, career status, and demographic characteristics, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, age, and so on. 
we want a broad spectrum of humanity and researchers. So. But also, on the other hand, it's important to be more homogenous on your principles, on your values, on your um, broad vision of what you want to be as a network. In other, one, in other words, you want to have a similar enough vision and a similar enough way to act while you pursue that vision. In the PSA, the five founding principles that all members agree to espouse when they join the network is diversity, decentralized authority, transparency, rigor, and openness to criticism. And because we have that as founding principles, the people that we attract also are people that already have those values. So, so it's important to be clear on the answer of where you want to be diverse and where you don't want to be so diverse. And speaking of diversity, because you all are coming from such different places, even if you have a similar vision, it's always good to just over explain and over communicate. Sometimes it feels silly to be very explicit about where you're coming from, about the assumptions that you're making when you're making your claims. But again, these assumptions very likely will not be shared <laughs> by, by many of your colleagues across disciplinary and geographic boundaries. So always good to over communicate, especially if you're just building and beginning with your community. I also want to emphasize the importance of watering holes and to either design or cultivate it in your network. Watering holes are spaces of continuing, uh, continuous engagement, which come from either the form of research projects or network committees that meet monthly, for example, or even spontaneous hackathons, which is an active sort of symposium where the team works for a concrete product, like um, drafting policies or drafting research ideas, or even just communal coffee chats, you know? And there are multiple benefits to watering holes. So one is that it builds individual social capital. There's so much information in the world, but only so much attention. And we attend to those people that we find to be trustworthy or worth our time. And these are usually the people that we have been able to build social capital with us. Of course, these also allow to build community trust. And watering holes really are spaces for creative exploration. Just yesterday, for example, with my coffee chat with Yo, we unearthed a resource that we normally wouldn't have shared or normally wouldn't have necessarily thought of. And if we did not make space for that watering hole, we, you know, that opportunity would never probably have uh, been unearthed. I also want to talk about the importance of structure for freedom. In large scale collaborative network, it's really important to bake in participatory processes in your bureaucracy. Uh, for example, in the PSA, policies are drafted by committees, but it's always ratified by the public. Um, and for spe special projects that we have, study selection is done by voting. Uh, this also means that you would want to have a clear governance structure. And part of this really is either an informal or formal stakeholder analysis, right? You want to ask yourselves, who are the stakeholders who have the interest and the ability to influence outcomes and the ability even to participate? But even with um, these stakeholders, when we say that we are doing participatory process, it doesn't need to be everything all at once. Depending on the interest and the ability of stakeholders, for example, even as simple as getting informed of what's happening, um, uh, you know, that's one very basic level of participation. Another, of course, is getting advice or getting feedback, um, being able to vote or being able to decide, being able to veto, for example. Even if the majority like the study, if it has a serious flaw in this methodology, a committee might be able to veto a study. Um, and for example, the highest level of participation is being able to lead an initiative. Again, different stakeholders may need or want different levels of participation. So being responsible is different from being accountable, is different from being consulted, is different to being you know, informed. And we want to build these different levels of participation for different levels, uh, different stakeholders as well. Of course, it goes without saying that knowledge sharing and the vitality of a network is facilitated by a strong culture where people are excited to be in the network, where there's professional and warm social conduct and so on. So networks really are only as strong as a group culture. However, culture, of course, tends to be intangible. 
and are in many ways, um, it's difficult, for example, for newcomers to, to know how to act given a new culture, which is where written documents like protocols and, and documents are really important to codify norms, processes, and reflect the group culture. But as you know, documents tend to be static and gets outdated as cultures and processes shift. So one thing that might be really good to consider are living documents, documents that the group commit to reviewing on a regular or agreed upon schedule. In the previous lab where I'm from, the core lab, we had a block of time at the start of every year where we just reviewed the lab philosophy document and worked on keeping it alive keeping what worked, modifying what didn't, looking if we still embodied the principles that we said we were going to embody, and so on. So it was a living document with many versions. Of course, as you know, with um, um, uh, or, uh, large groups of people, conflicts are inevitable, which is also why it's important as a leader or even as an active member to create a culture that balances openness to criticism, but also with grades. Of course, criticism is very important in the scientific work that we do. And we also want, really want to balance that with the grace of treating humans as humans. This is also where clear governance structures are important, right? When conflict happens, who is accountable for what exactly? Um, are there, if there are grievances, who do people go to? And this is also why it's really important to recruit people that you share values with. Conflicts and disagreements are so much more productive when you share principles. Uh, when you don't, so much of, of disagreements can just be, you know, empty chaos. And because conflicts are inevitable, we also want to take the opportunity to fail forward. Um, it's cliche, but conflicts can eliminate what people want, what people expect, uh, clarifying goals, clarifying structures and processes as well. So all this to wrap up to the fact that openness to diversity of knowledge requires participatory processes and solid community building. And the reality of it is that participatory processes and community building take time. So you always want to give yourself time when you embark on initiatives like this. Open science work best when we get to leverage and share our knowledge. But really, knowledge sharing doesn't exist in a vacuum. And knowledge, and really, it needs care and cultivation of the underlying processes so we can really fulfill the promise of open science and big team science. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Miguel. Actually, that was really interesting for me at least. I hope it's really interesting for everyone. I see what you've presented. So kind of I resonate with what you've mentioned. I am currently in a project that has multiple collaboration. And I see the values in um, trying to take some of these things that you've mentioned. Um, so thank you very much. I don't know if we have questions or oh, let me also check the other part. So uh, we have a question here. I like the principle and values that you have articulated. I wonder if localization might be another principle. Um, yeah, definitely. I think the great thing about creating your own initiatives like this, you're creating your own network, is that you get to define your own core values, right? Um, I'm part of this network as well, Abrir, uh, which is a global South-led um. Uh, network of, of, of psychologists, which, you know, they have a shared overlap with, with principles in, 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 in Psychological Science Accelerator, but they also really get to define who they are, what their identities are, and what their mission are. So in that case, yes, definitely, if localization is what you believe uh, uh, will get you to your outcomes, have that as a core founding principle. Uh, that, that's uh, definitely, um, you know, the, the beauty of, of establishing this big team science network so uh, um, sure. second, should i read question or um the second question is a criticism brought by lolini in the philosophy of open science which i would like to bring up here how do you balance the standardization focus of open science uh, in bracket open push by rich countries with the diversity slash local uniqueness Great question. Um, great question. 
Oh uh, God, when we talk about power relations, it's always going to be a tricky issue. Um, of course, there's no one, you know, uh, this is a deep problem, many ways to go about it. One of my advice would be make sure that the landscape is also sort of already equal-ish at this onset. So you want the leadership team to already be representative of the people that you want represented on. So in the case of establishing your own big team science network, it might be the case that you already want, you know, um, people from lower and middle income countries on the onset and not just as an addition. So when you draft your policies, when you um, when you ratify your policies, their perspectives are already put into the fold. Um, of course, one of the things that do get, uh, one of the things that do get trapped in all of this is that you know, the power of the purse is all, or always, always there. Um, um, the, the, the power to change material resources for funding will all, always be there, which usually comes from, you know, um, middle and higher income countries, in which case you also want to then tap into funders that also share your vision, right? Um, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't, in a way that, that, uh, part of it is also looking into funders and partners that share your vision, that share your founding principles as well, uh, that would also let you uh, do your work with integrity. <laughs> Not a simple endeavor at all, you know, it might be looking for, for a needle in a haystack, but, but those are the things that we try to do as we navigate um, uh, the things that we, you know, uh, navigate the integrity of, of, of a network. Um, thank you. And the other question we have is, is there, is there a trade-off between value diversity, which you don't want, and other diversity, which you want? If so, how do you make the trade-off? Hmm. Yes, there is. A, a, it's hard because um, it's hard to talk about these things in abstract. Um. But maybe one of the uh, if we can make it concrete, for example, there are as uh, like there are brilliant thinkers, for example, on Twitter, as as a discussion was there earlier, for example, brilliant thinkers on Twitter, but are just really assholes. Um, and so of course, on one that on one hand, right, like um, is there a cost? benefit to that you, if, you, if you don't interact with them you might not gather etc but I think there are structures for for you can create infrastructures that would minimize the their assholeness with with their contribution to the world for example not engaging with them on Twitter but just reading their 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 articles could be one thing, for example, and that can be the thing for in your networks as well. The people that have important perspectives, you can relegate them to, for example, um, uh, much more structured forms of communication like uh, uh, Google Forms, etc., opinion surveys, while not really letting them, for example, uh, uh, spread their assholeness in 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 Slack or in a network. Uh, of course, the ideal thing would be everyone shares, you know, we're kumbaya, everyone shares the same values. We don't live in that perfect world. So we do want to find those sort of, of compromises and, and uh, messy navigations as we deal with, with science as a social process, as Sarah said. Um, thank you. Let me see if there are other questions. Um, no. So maybe if someone has a question or a comment that wants to speak out um no okay another no okay so we are going to have a breakout session um Debs will be introducing us to that and starting the breakout rooms over to you Debs hey hi everyone hi can everybody hear me Hello, hello, hello. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you, Miguel. That was that was incredible. I like how you talked about balancing grace and criticism. I think that's what lots of organizations lack. We will be going straight up to the breakout rooms. Thank you, everyone who has written S in front of their names for speaking and W for the rating breakout rooms. So for this breakout rooms, we're going to be having the following prompts. 
First of all, do you think scientific research is open? If yes, how is it open? Why do you call it open? If you wouldn't call it open, why not? Can we then call it closed science and not open science? If applicable, include a comment on who is inside that closeted science and who is out or who belongs to it and who doesn't. That's a lot of prompts. So I'm just going to copy and paste in each of the breakout sessions. Everybody ready? A moment. So you can just go ahead and unmute. And I can uh, speak um, if that's okay. Um, so I was in the speaking, the spoken group, I guess. Um, and our discussion was more along the lines that <clears throat> science seems to be generally more closed than we would like to. And also that's why we are here for the efforts of making it more open. Um, but also um, that it can have like different gradations of that. So it can be closed at the level sometimes of the lab. Some labs are more competitive and people work in separate projects that they don't really communicate, but also between uh, labs or between institutions, depending on the political or institutes between uh, political, because of political reasons sometimes. Um, but it's not everyone, and there are people that seem to be uh, wanting it for it to be more open and sometimes really practicing it uh, for a long time now. Um, and um, then for the part of, um, at the same time, the group didn't really agree of, I mean, completely on calling it completely closed. So we saw it something that is generally closed. But there are some doors that sometimes you might be able to get to the open state, but it often relies on a political influence and being having access to these doors. So one could still argue that it's closed for a lot of people. So I guess it, this, the, the argument goes in circles, but it's more or less, the, that's what I got from the discussion at least. And I, I would invite my peers to bring more points if they want. Thank you for sharing that, Eduardo. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to contribute? Oh, I see Robert applauding me. Any other contributions? Or can we move on? Hey, Taj, with your blessing, I would like to bring Monica up. Um, sure. I think there is a comment in the um, chat here on the Etherpad, we, the writing group, discuss how we can encourage more openness and how it is important to have support staff and training so academics don't have to figure out themselves and that actual recognition is also quite important to encourage openness. Um, thank you, the writing group. Uh, I would like to call on uh, Monica to give uh, the presentation on open evaluation. Thank you. Thanks, Taj. Thanks, Deborah. The link to the slides are in the Etherpad. So, um, and they're CC by, so feel free to remix and reuse them. But I will present from my computer. So the general title of uh, this segment is around open evaluation and open evaluation in the research process. And there's many different places, I think, where you can have open evaluation from the submission of like of your grant, the way that 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 researchers are assessed in general for tenure and promotion. But today I'm going to talk about um, open reviews and the peer review process. 
Um, before I move on, can anybody can everybody see my screen? Thanks, yeah. The thumbs up. I'm Monica Granados. I am on the leadership team of pre-review, so I'll be talking to you from the perspective of what pre-review is doing to move towards open reviews. And I'm going to tell you why we think that there's many benefits to moving towards open. Okay, so let's start really broad. What is peer review? So very generally, it's the um, peer review, or at least the traditional model of peer review is the evaluation of work done by one or more people with similar competencies as the producers of the work. Okay, so what's the process of peer review, at least in the traditional sense? So you write up your paper, you know, it's finalized, your uh, supervisor has looked at it, or maybe some uh, friendly peers have looked at it, and you then upload it to uh, a manuscript central type of system or an analog where it, it's a bit of a black box. You know, you, you upload it to, uh, to this website and then it sort of goes out of your hands. And at least when I was a grad student, just did a lot of like crossing my fingers that good things would happen after I submitted it to, you know, the, the uh, evaluation team. So what happens kind of behind the scenes of that? Um, so, so usually what happens is that it's first looked at by um, like a, an editor to see if it's even a good fit for the journal. So you can be very quickly rejected if it's not uh, what they consider a good fit. And so what does that mean? What does having a good fit really mean? How do you really define that? You know, that's really difficult to do. And that's problem number one. If they do deem it as a good fit, it then goes to usually a subject matter editor. So someone who has a specific expertise in that like subdomain of the paper that you wrote uh, the, the research on. Um, and it goes to this person. Uh, statistically, it's probably gonna be a man. And we'll talk about why that's a problem. And then they are going to send it out to other reviewers so that they have more uh, input from people about your uh, about your work. You often do know who the subject matter editor is, like who the handling editor is. But once it goes out to other reviewers, so that they have two or three to then like coalesce on a decision about whether your paper uh, gets rejected or accepted or asks for revisions, you usually don't know who those individuals are. Really what this means is that this, this process, there's so many different places where the process is mysterious and not mysterious in like the fun way, mysterious in that like it's a way to ingrain a lot of bias into a process. And so having this type of process brings up a lot of issues. This closed process is really flawed. It's inequitable and really from a logistical perspective, it's really unsustainable too. The pool of reviewers that the handling editor is picking from is often really small, meaning that editors have to ask many people to review the, the manuscript before they get an acceptance. And that number of people that they're asking to review is increasing. There's actually been, um, you know, analysis of how many people editors have to ask to review, and it's increasing because there's so much research being produced uh, now relative to like when the peer review process was started. Another big problem is that the composition of the reviewer pool is really homogenous. As I mentioned, the handling editor will probably be a man. It's probably going to be a white man statistically. And then what does that mean? It means that like they're more likely to know people that look like them. So they're more likely to send it to an editor that is uh, send it to a reviewer that's also a white a white man, or probably they met at you know functions or in institutions where their circles intersected. And usually what that does is that just ingrains more and more homogeneity in the um, in the interactions that they have 
and in the thought process and in the like lived experience that is being represented in the reviewers. I mentioned they're gonna be mostly male, mid to late career researchers um, selected, like you know, the, the, the experts that they know are the people that they know. They're most likely gonna know people that are like them. Anonymity also lead, could lead to inappropriate reviews. It shields reviewers from, uh, you know, from being held responsible for some of the comments. And, you know, there's, there's lots of anecdotes out there about particularly early career researchers receiving really unfair and non-constructive criticism in their reviews. And there's no retribution or there's no accountability because the reviewers are anonymous. Okay, so those are some of the issues with closed review. How could open review tackle some of these issues that I talked about today? Well, first of all, if we open up the reviewer pool to not just the individuals that the handling editor selects, it can make the reviewer pool less homogenous. You know, if we have a system where you can take from different parts of the community to put into the review process or soliciting reviews more widely, you'll make the reviewer pool less homogenous by making it bigger, by moving away from the people that you know and that are like you. If we talk about reviews not only being posted, so you know, mo in the traditional review process, reviews are also only available to the author and, and to the reviewers. In an open review, there's the possibility not only that the review itself is posted with the manuscript or with the final paper, but you also can de-anonymize the reviewers. So the reviewers are not anonymous. It's transparent who the reviewers are. When you have, you know, both that open and non-anonymous reviewers, there's more accountability. It means that you probably will get more timely and quality reviews because you're signing your name to the review as the reviewer so that you can't hide behind anonymity also means you will complete your work faster because you're accountable to not only the author, but also uh, the journal or whatever system that you're using to provide that review with. It can also reduce bias and conflict of interest because of the, the anonymization. If you have your name associated with the review, the, you know, uh, there's more confronting of the bias and also particularly conflicts of interest because you will, you know, you will know what institution they come from or, you know, potentially where some conflict of interest might arise in ways that when you're an anonymous reviewer, you know, there's no accountability. It also can foster collaborative culture of peer feedback that like this is, you know, this is what we do. We do it in a constructive way. It just engenders a much better culture of review and as a like positive process in the in, in creating research and creating knowledge. Okay, so who supports open review? Um, in the journals, so a couple of examples are F1000. The image here is a screenshot from the F1000 page. So this is a, an a, a article actually about open science and um, like what universities can do to ingrain open science. So this is sort of traditionally what you see, it's just the, you know, you abstract in the, in the paper, but you'll also see that the reviews are posted alongside the publication. So you actually can see who the reviewers are. They're all, uh, they're all um, sort of signed reviews. And you also can see like the different versions of uh, reviews that went, that came back on this manuscript, as well as different versions of the manuscript lots more transparency in this type of process and you can see sort of what the reviewers how the reviewers improved the manuscript and also sort of how the manuscript changed um, in the peer review process 
So that's at the journal level. So that's, you know, when you, you submit through that, through uh, a journal system. Something else that's becoming really popular are preprint review services. And the advantage of a preprint review service is that, you know, you're not going through a journal system, also meaning that you are not going to be paying a fee in, in most of these cases, because what you're doing is just uploading your preprint to a preprint server, and then infrastructure that works on top of preprint servers is facilitating the review. So um, a couple of examples are uh, pre-lights. So pre-lights, what they do is they have like um, uh, pre-lighters that will go and look for preprints in preprint servers and then uh, review them, or really highlight them as, you know, a good, a good preprint or good research. So they're sort of like, they're kind of like preprint scouts. Um, review Commons is more like the traditional peer review system where like they're taking a preprint and then facilitating a review, uh, but of a, but of a preprint. Again, what's neat about doing a preprint is not only is, is it um, free, you also can get feedback on your manuscript much earlier in the process than a traditional system or the traditional process that can take, you know, up to, you know, 12 months sometimes just to get reviews back. Then finally, um, free review, which is the organization that I work with, what we do is really taking a lot of the concepts that I talked about that are beneficial in open review, that are challenging the, the, the barriers and issues with traditional review and really centering community uh, inclusion and thinking about equity and how we can do that, how we can infuse that into the peer review process. So at pre-review, we're facilitating uh, preprint review. So at pre-review, you uh, can pull in a DOI of almost any preprint on any preprint server and review it. So it's an agnostic peer review tool. You can just pull in the DOI. And to participate in this process, all you have to do is have an ORCID ID. So really what we're trying to promote here is saying that this tool and reviewing is for everyone. We're not, we're not gatekeeping who can review. We're not only inviting a certain you know, group of people. We're saying, if you have expertise, and you want to take time to use that expertise to make science better, we're going to make it easy for you using this, uh, uh, using this platform. So you just pull in the DOI um, uh, that's associated with the preprint that you want to review. And then we give you also options for how you want to review it. So you can, we've got um, prompts, so it'll give you sort of like a template or like questions. And we have a, a basic template that's just really um, uh, a lot more general to allow you a little bit more of like free flow. Or if you've already written the review in like a, a document using your own formatting and structure, you also have that ability to just upload that. So again, you know, giving you an option and, um, you know, facilitating different stages or comfort levels with reviewing from just answering questions with prompts all the way to if you're you know an expert reviewer who's, who's done this many times you can use your own formatting um, so you know this is a, a an example of the structured review so these are the kinds of questions that you'll get to give you some guidance if you're new to reviewing and all the reviews get uh, DOIs and are licensed um, with a CC BY 4.0 license, meaning that they can be remixed and reused, translated, you know, trying to um, make not only the content that you're producing your own and giving you a DOI so that it's citable and you can put it on your CV, but also so that it's shareable. We also recently introduced free review clubs so that if you want to coalesce with some with, with a group of people um, around around like a specific subject area in research, you can form a club within your own institution or across 
con across continents, all coalescing around like a common theme. We facilitate that for you at pre-review. Actually, a, a link if you want to learn more about our clubs. I'll leave you with this, um, which is just a, um, a link to our newsletter and our Slack. If you have any questions, you can email us at community at pre-review.org. Um, we offer a ton of training too on uh, on peer review, really focusing again the lens of, of of equity, diversity, and inclusion, so that you know we break down some of the issues that exist in traditional review. Um, thank you very much, Monica. That was um, really interesting. Uh, so we are at the end of the call in terms of time, but I guess it's worth um, spending a few minutes to um, look at the questions and uh, comments. I personally have a question that I would like to see out here. Nobody has been asking questions. So um, the questions that um, in the other part, how does open review deal with power balance between the reviewee and reviewer? specifically if the reviewee is more established than the reviewer and the reviewer is early career, wouldn't the reviewer work that they may offend a big name in the field? Yeah, so one of the things that we do at, at pre-review and we encourage other um, systems that are doing open review is to think about what we call pseudo-anonymity. So if particularly uh, if you're an early career researcher, you may want to be anonymous publicly so that if you sign your review with a pseudonym that is attached to your name. So on the back end, the pre-review staff know what your pseudonym and your real name is so that if there is a violation of a code of conduct, for example, we can we can um, tag it with your real name. Also, we're hoping to eventually also facilitate, you know, say for like five years, you, you're you reviewing under the pseudonym because you're an early career researcher and you're sort of still trying to establish yourself. There's the issue of the power dynamics. Eventually, you're like, okay, no, I think I'm well enough established. I, you know, I'm, I'm less worried about this. We can de-anonymize that your reviews so that your reviews can then be attached to your real name. So these are the kind of things that we're that we're thinking about at pre-review, and always invite these types of questions of like, are there issues that we haven't thought of? Is there a way that we can integrate something into our system um, from a different perspective or um, uh, an imbalance? That, that particularly that this type of system creates. Um, um, thank you. Uh, please, if you need to drop up, please, um, you can do that. And if you have a few more minutes, we can talk through some of the comments here. So we have a comment, um, another open review system I quite like, it's Open Research Europe, but it's a shame that it's only available to researchers who receive a grant through the European Union. And the last one here is, I also find most editors are from the global north, which can impose further biases, like in terms of language and the locality and importance of studies. Absolutely, and that's something that Preview is also trying to do is um, we offer training for editors and for reviewers to challenge those biases, right? To, to, and, and a lot of it is unconscious. And, and we're, we're trying to surface those unconscious biases that are negatively affecting, particularly authors that are coming from not the global north or not a fancy institution, right? Like we know that if an author or if a reviewer sees their, you know, the authors from Harvard, it's going to get a very different review than an, than an author from like, the, from Unan in Mexico. And it's the reality and we need to surface those biases to, to help them challenge those the biases that are absolutely embedded in, in this process. Yes, thank you. And my comment is, so I think um, open review will be really good in areas such as um, artificial intelligence, where you mostly you have conferences instead of um, normal journal publications. The turnaround time is really fast, but then if you don't, um, but they have quota of numbers of papers that can accept. So if your paper is not accepted in um, in, in a conference, probably um, having those reviews open can help in the next um, submission you are going to do. And then sometimes you have conflicting 
um, revisions. So someone will tell you it's uh, that's not the way to do it. And another person will say, no, that's the way to do it. So there are conflicting reviews that come up sometimes in, in some of these fields. Okay, um, any other comments or questions, anyone? I do have a question, Taj, but I'll be dropping that on Slack for lack of time. Okay. Thank you, Monica. This was amazing. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you everyone for joining. I'll call on Emmanuel to give the last few announcements before we get the uh we close the call. Thank you. Back to you, Emmanuel. Okay, hi everyone. I'm sure you enjoyed the call today. We want to thank our speakers. I want to thank our facilitators and the host. So we'd like you to listen to this announcement. Um, please, we'd like you to check your GitHub, introduction notes, learning resources, and videos from last week. In the header part, we have the notes with the link. And also, we want you to also remember that you could prepare to share your projects online to the GitHub pages, uh, Google site, WordPress, and other option. We want you to know that um, this is not an urgent assignment. You should do it at your own space. And if you have any question, you could send in through, you could send it to us through email on Slack. We have someone there who is going to be responding. And also very important, we'd like you to give a feedback on today's call. And I also want to remind you that um, next week call is going to be a mentor meeting meeting, uh, which will be starting on Monday. Any of the days you could meet with your mentor. Then November 1 is going to be a question and answer section. So if you have questions, please do, free, do feel free to join the session for that week. So we look forward to having you uh, when next we'll be having a court call. So thank you once again for joining. Yeah, have a great day ahead. Um, thank you, everyone. It was really nice having you here all. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you.